The title of this talk is Engineering Hygienic Macros in Rust. As you can see, the title is too large for the slide, and in much the same way, the talk is too long for 10 minutes, but I have started a timer, and I will do my best. In order that you have something useful to take away from this blizzard of words, I want to start out by stating my three or four central points first. Number one, Rust is awesome. Number two, Macros is awesome. Number three, Hygiene is awesome. And number four, if you're willing to tolerate a little grammatical incorrectness, you can generate your uh, slides with codes like this. Okay, let's move on. Why Rust? Uh, this is the slide that I tend to get stuck on because of all of the awesome stuff. Okay, to give you some background, uh, Rust is a low-level systems language designed to be fast, safe, and concurrent. It's from Mozilla Research, and it gives the programmer low-level control over the layout of memory. It gives the programmer predictable performance uh, in terms of both memory and time. And at the same time, it has a whole bunch of high-level features that allow you to write code that's more abstract and more elegant and more wonderful. One of the, perhaps the most interesting feature of Rust is its treatment of pointers. Rust uses a, uh, a uniqueness system uh, that is built upon regions, but, but not entirely equivalent to them. What you can see in this slide is that there are sigils, such as the ampersand and the twiddle, that describe the way that pointers are to be treated. Pointers can be borrowed. Uh, pointers are always owned by at least one stack frame. And when a uh, stack frame releases a pointer, it is guaranteed uh, to be collect collected. At the same time, you have a type safety uh, theorem stating that bad stuff can't happen. So you can sort of have your cake and eat it too uh, with Rust. Rust is an, uh, is an awesome language. I'm not going to talk anymore about it uh, now, <coughs> at least not about how awesome it is. Why macros? Macros are useful for a bunch uh, of different things, and I hope I'll, I'll show why they're particularly awesome uh, for Rust. One of the classic uses of macros is for changing the order of evaluation. This is a macro definition. It comes from the standard library in Rust. It's a definition of a log macro. And one thing that you would like to be true of a log macro is that its arguments are not evaluated at all uh, if the log rule does not fire. So to be more specific, uh, this defines a log macro and it does some pattern matching, suggesting that a use of the log macro needs to have an expression and a number of other arguments. It expands see that blue arrow there, it expands into the uh, piece of code delimited by the curly braces. And what you'll see here is that if uh, the level is not less than or equal to the underscore underscore log level, that the arguments are not evaluated uh, at all. So you can see that Rust uses a, a macro by example style pattern matching macro system. Another classic example of macro use is for uh, a data sublanguage. This is a, a pretty normal example, and the idea here is that printline or printf or what have you would like to do some compile time analysis of its format argument to make sure that it has the right number of arguments. At the same time, you don't really want to make that a part of the specification of your language. By creating it as a macro, you have your cake and you can eat it too. That is to say, it's not a part of the language specification, but you can provide a macro implementation that performs the kinds of analysis and gives good error messages and essentially gives you what you want there. Another great one, and this is particularly true for low-level languages, uh, in particular languages where you don't have this lispy tradition that everything is, is an expression, there are often large top-level declarations that you would really like to be able to abstract over, but you can't because they're not functions. So this particular slide shows four uses uh, of a macro that extends the implementation of the, a comparison trait from a type to essentially tuples of that type. This, is, this particular chunk of code is saying, oh, this, this works for eek and for things that have total eek and for things that are or of type ord. Um, and for things that are that are total ord. The expansion of this macro 
is long, longer, long enough that you certainly don't want to have four copies of this thing lying around. I don't really, it's okay with me if you can't read this slide. The whole point of it is that uh, you don't want to duplicate it four times and macros allow you to do that. All right, so macros are great. Why hygiene in four minutes and 44 seconds? So the classic problem that we use hygiene to solve is that of identifier capture. So here we have a pretty standard macro uh, that is used for checking uh, for a test case generation. Essentially, it's an assert equals macro that checks that the given expression evaluates the same thing as the expected expression. And in this macro, uh, macros are about rearranging chunks of code. So we're going to be dropping in uh, some chunk of code called expected into the middle of this large block of macro expanded code in the, what is it, fifth line there, right? Let expected val equal dollar expected. Now, the danger here, uh, observed in 1986, Kolbeck uh, is that this chunk of code may contain a reference to uh, a variable named given val. And that would be bad because that use would then become or could become captured by the binding for given val that occurs in the line before. And that would be bad. It would produce crazy code that does not mean what the programmer hopes that it means. It would mean that anybody who used the assert eek macro would have to know exactly how it expanded. And that's not a useful language extension mechanism. All right. There's another symmetric problem that can occur here, which is that since this macro block is going to get dropped into the code where the macro is used, you also don't want variables in this block to be captured by variables present in the at the expansion site. Instead, you would like these three variables to refer to things in the context of the macro definition site. So there's two symmetric pieces to this. And if someone says to you, well, you can just solve these problems by generating fresh identifiers, well, the answer is you could do that for the first case, but not really for the second one. Okay, so that's kind of the classic macro story. There's another, there's another important use of, of um, value in, in hygiene, and this is instead of lurking capture, I think I would call this lurking non-capture, lurking failure to capture. So this is an example of a macro that occurs in the Rust compiler that when we deployed hygiene, we discovered was not hygienic. Right, so this is a pretty simple use. What's going on here is that someone has written a short macro called bench to abstract over calls to maybe run test. And then they've used it four times in this main function. I have two minutes left. And uh, the problem here is that this macro, it is it is not clear where the bound uses of argv are. That is to say, if I look at the function main, it appears that there are exactly two bound uses of argv. Whereas, at least in the system before hygiene, there were actually three, and one of them was floating around in a different part of the file. It could have been in a different file altogether. And so when the programmer comes, you know, 10 years later and changes argv and looking for bound uses of it, oh, they change these two, and suddenly, bang, everything goes horribly wrong. So this is an example of what I might call a lurking non-capture, and a hygienic macro system alerts you to these. It says, that doesn't work. You can't do that. All right. Now, it's not hard to fix this problem at all. There's, there's two perfectly good solutions. One is to explicitly pass argv in like this, uh, and the other one is just to put the macro definition inside of the main function. So now it becomes perfectly obvious that there are three bound uses of argv. The point is that the hygiene system alerted you to this potential uh, lurking failure. Okay, now I have 53 seconds left and I am supposed to talk about our contribution <laughs> and I won't have time but let me at least uh, allude to the, the work that we did and this will be one of these death by PowerPoint slides. Rust presents a number of fascinating problems for macro deployment. Here's one of them. It uses a system where double colons are used for namespace uh, scoping. So syntax x expand is a reference to uh, the top level module syntax and then x within that and then expand within that. And the question is what exactly is an identifier in the system? Is it the whole thing including the double colons? Is each one of them a separate identifier? 
and which ones should be treated hygienically. Turns out that for rust, at least, it makes most sense to treat them individually, which is not what we were originally thinking. Yeah, I'm out of time. Okay, um, all right, I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna cheat for about 45 seconds. Um, Rust also has some fascinating properties whereby expansion must be carried out before it is known whether or not identifiers are, are, are bindings or not, which is kind of crazy. Um, th th we needed an unusual system to deal with that. Uh, there are also many uses of identifiers that are not references to variables. Uh, things like method names and, and field names. So we needed a system that would allow those to coexist. And finally, where is it that we are going to attach the syntax information that we need to make this work? Do we attach it to every node in the syntax tree just to identifiers? So it turns out that we managed to solve these uh, using um, by, by adapting the model that comes from the macros that work together, uh, paper by flat and others. It turns out that that model gave us sufficient firepower, if you will, to actually be lazy in the sense that it builds up context information in a way that allows us to use that information uh, at, a, at a later point during the compiler. Now this did involve some key simplifications and or feature removal uh, from that model. Um, and <laughs> unfortunately I don't have time to talk about that now. So this is the point at which I would ask for questions, except that I'm not actually speaking to a live audience. So thank you very much for your time and have a wonderful day.